since this is an air power seminar basically, the Pakistan Air Force and uh, the PLA Air Force, and I'll call it PLAF. And finally, the op implications of ongoing developments. If you consider the strategic environment around us, we'll do that under the political, diplomatic, and economic issues, and of course, the air power issues. If we take Pakistan, they have a new government. Has the Pakistan army's hand been strengthened? Now, this is a tweet put out by the government official handle of Pakistan. Read the second part. They reiterated their determination for lasting peace and stability in the country and exchanged views on security situation in the region. It looks like a joint statement after heads of government meeting of two different governments. So, will, and I think so, the Pakistan army's control over the foreign and defense policies, they would be the drivers of Kashmir, Kashmir policy. And the defense budget, despite their economic woes, is 3.2% of their GDP this year and would likely stay so, if not increase. Now, the diplomatic and economic issues. And remember, just in 20 minutes, we can tackle only this much, so I'll just tackle the important parts. The nexus between Pakistan and China, the indebtedness to China would only increase due to the CPEC. Dependence on military hardware will continue and will increase in a way. And if you look from the Chinese side, Pakistan is too valuable to let go or to collapse or to degenerate. There is their link to the Arabian Sea, besides being the, the flagship program of the BRI. Pakistan is, let's face facts, in the central position in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is uh, very important for it. And it will maintain and try and maintain a center stage position in whatever happens in Afghanistan. With Sri Lanka, it's making inroads. Same with Myanmar. The first foreign customer uh, is the Myanmarese Air Force, six JF-17s. And let's not forget, is there a trilateral developing with China and Russia, Pakistan being the third one, basically on the importance of Afghanistan because of its location, because of the economic interests, and because of the terrorism that might spill over into these other countries. Switching to China. Suddenly there's a rise of statesmen in China. Who could think that the president of China would go to Davos and talk about globalization? But that's what they are doing through the BRI, the economic clout, and through what I call loan warfare. They are appending the Western institutions, setting new international norms. When it suits them, they look towards international um, you know, norms. And when it doesn't, as it happened in, in the Philippines case, the PCA verdict, they just don't honor it. With respect to India, the border disputes will not go away in a hurry. That's for sure. Do we still have the Tibet card? One needs to ponder on this. Uh, the worrying factor is that asymmetry is building up in all spheres. And as far as military men are concerned, we have to be very careful that the military in the military field, and I'll talk a little more about it as I go along, that needs to be taken notice of. The balance of trade, of course, is a problem, $60 billion as it exists. Will it make an impact if we stop it? Uh, as some people commented in the media during Doklam, well, their foreign trade is $3 trillion. That's 3,000 billion, 60 billion doesn't make a difference for them. For, so we have to keep our, uh, you know, our arguments correct. And of course, there is the CPEC, uh, CPEC issue of the fact that it is passing through Indian territory in the POK. So let's switch to air power issues. The capabilities with, of Pakistan Air Force, the offensive platforms. As was mentioned earlier, around 70 plus uh, F-16s Midlife upgrade by Turkey, Turkish aerospace industry, which is authorized. Actually, it's like a factory in a way, in a way. So help from Turkey, even if there are sanctions, even in a future conflict for respect to spare parts and help, technical help, cannot be, you know, wished away. The JF-17s, uh, the Block 2 is already being inducted. The Block 3 with the ISR radar, air-to-air refueling, that's, uh, that's, on the, uh, that's being developed. The trainer version is already flying, three prototypes, and with uh, new BVRs being incorporated. Various uh, press reports 
put the numbers at 150 induction, some say even 90 to 200. The legacy fighters will be replaced by the Block 2, JF-17s, and later the Block 3s. The combat enablers, AVACs and AWNC, this is important, they, up, they would by 2020 have 10 AVACs and AWCs. That's sufficient for the type of air um, uh, environment they face. Flight refuelers, four IL-78s are already in the inventory. The training, this is important because the air crew are having live experience due to so-called anti-terrorist ops. And when we're talking of anti-terrorist ops, uh, one wonders why air-to-air -air missiles of the latest kinds uh, have been imported by them uh, from America and the countries have given them for anti-terrorist operations. Exercises with the Western Air Forces, as was mentioned earlier, uh, red flag with Turkey and the annual Shaheen series with Pakistan. They are trying to get westernized training and move away from the ethos of centralized control of the Soviet Union and later the Russians. And they have a networked air defense. Let's move to PLAF, PLA Air Force. Uh, this is a slide I've borrowed from um, uh, uh, Tiang, uh, Tia Meng Chung, there's a, this is an American uh, uh, researcher looking into the uh, America, to Chinese manufacturing and R&D. And how have they moved? We all know that they moved from duplicative you know, imitation to creative imitation, moved on to creative adaptation, and then incrementally innovating, changing to you know, innovating components, changing architecture, and then moving to disruptive innovation. And the example of disrup disruptive innovation is the J20. It is certainly a disruptive innovative thing, but more importantly, is it a, a statement of intent too? It is conveying that we have arrived. We are very clo closing in on the technologically advanced countries. And how is this happening? This is in the R&D of China in all spheres, not just not the military. In 1991, 0.72% of their GDP was pumped in, which was $13.4 billion. In 2015, they pumped in 2.07%, and that constituted 20% of world's R&D expenditure. That's the type of R&D money and focus that is going on in China. So they're offensive platforms. With this development, let's see where are they heading to. Their offensive fleet, J-20, from first flight in 2011, just five years, eight prototypes, 2016, production started, an aircraft inducted, five years. Now they have roughly 10 J-20s as per the uh, uh, in the media reports. The J-20, Su-27, and the various J-11 variants, and the H-6K bomber, which is a modernized Tupolev. The J-31, only two prototypes, but they are saying it's for export, cheaper version. However, important watch to watch out for is that it is being developed for their aircraft carrier, the third one, or rather the second indigenous one. Talking of armament, they are developing the, uh, the very long range air to air missile, they claim 300 kilometer range, and engine enhancements. That is one uh, Achilles heel at present but they're pumping a lot of money and R&D into getting fighter engine technology. So that's the J-20 for you. You've seen it in various forms. That's a computer-generated image of the J-31, which is likely to go on the aircraft carrier. And this is that VLRAM, the very long-range air-to-air missile, which is supposed to be you know, fired at 300 kilometers range at high-value aircraft assets like uh, FRAs and AVACs. Engine modifications, this is a J-10B um, with a thrust vectoring WS-10B engine, which has been mounted here. So this engine uh, with thrust vector control, we don't know whether it is being developed for the J-10C, which will enhance the capability of the J-10 manifold, or it is R&D going on for the WS-15 engine, of, uh, which is supposed to go on the J-20 to give it super cruise capability. And what are their futuristic pro uh, projects right now? 
prompt global strike to strike any target in the world within one hour of the order being given. The hypersonic aircraft wave rider flew. And I'll show you a slide later. Long range strategic bomber has been announced by the chief in November 2016 that they are developing this, which is likely to be stealthy, a flying wing design, and already they are giving it a name in the media, H-20. So remember, J-20, Y-20 transport, H-20, possibly the long-range strategic bomber. Will we see it in Zuhai in two months' time? Let's see. And that's the uh, hypersonic wave rider aircraft, Mark 6.6, .6, has flown. And that's the vehicle before it was, uh, you know, launched here. So what is their airlift? That was the offensive platforms. What about the airlift capability? That's the Y-20 with Russian engines, the D-30KP, which has got a capability of 50 tons. Once their indigenous engine comes up, it'll go up to 66 tons. Possibly seven aircraft are in service, uh, but the important part, besides the transport and the airlift, they will be the base for future AVACs and FRA. Now, this is a satellite photo of last month. Uh, it shows nine Y-20s and 10 H-6K bombers. Now, I'm, you know, when I start, we start thinking of this, why so many aircraft outside one airfield, outside a few hangars? Now, is this some perception management going on or is this real? I'm sure the INT guys can take on and answer that at leisure. But this is doing the rounds on Twitter. Uh, there's Y9, which is the counterpart to the C-130, totally Chinese, the AN-225, that's important. Uh, only one aircraft flying, the whole plant has been bought by the Chinese. So this aircraft which is flying uh, will now be owned by China. This is the second fuselage lying uh, undeveloped for the last 10 years because the Ukrainians ran out of money. Will be developed, taken to China, and the factory will be located in China. They will make six hubs for transshipment of outsized, outsized loads uh, like power plants, uh, generators, and things like that. But that adds to the airlift. One must remember that because it also can carry four tanks. The, the largest amphibious aircraft, the AG-600, has done water taxiing just 15 days back. A word on naval aviation because we have the Indian Ocean region. Remember, we have the, they have the Lioning with the ski jump, the first indigenous aircraft carrier which is doing sea trials that also has the ski jump, and the J-15 is the aircraft. But the second indigenous aircraft, uh, aircraft carrier will have a catapult launch, whether it is electromagnetic or steam is yet to be seen, but they are testing out both. The important part is the J-15 is already flying, testing the catobar um, uh, arrangements that are required on the aircraft. So. Uh, they already have an aircraft in view. The J-15 will continue to be the aircraft uh, for the ski jump, for the catapult launch. And this is their ground testing facility. Uh, here you see uh, the island of the aircraft carrier. This is for basically EMI, EMC. And important part to note is this. Uh, the equivalent of the E-2C, American AEWNC carrier borne aircraft. So EMI, EMC tests are on. We can expect something like this, this aircraft coming up for the second indigenous, which will be the third aircraft carrier. What about heli lift? Starting off from the Mi-4 way back with Russian help, they now have the Z-19 with the mast mounted site. Uh, the Z-10 attack helicopter, which is the major one. The Z-18 super Frelon based three engine uh, high altitude capability aircraft. But more importantly to watch out for is this development Two years back, they have entered into a collaboration with the Russians. The Russians don't have the money. The Chinese don't have that type of technology. This is basically the Mi-46, which the Russians wanted to develop in the beginning of the 90s, but they didn't have money. So now, this is what is happening, but this will be a much more modernized one, uh, the advanced heavy lift helicopter. Combat enablers of three types is what they have. Uh, they would mount their AVACs on the Y-20, as I mentioned earlier. FRAs, uh, that's uh, a problem with them right now. They have the H-6U, which can refuel only Chinese aircraft, and the IL-78, only Russian aircraft. 
uh, that's a handicap that they have, but uh, they would develop, I suppose, later the Y20 as the FRA. If you Google UAV China, you'll get at least five to six screens of UAVs. They are the world leaders as far as the UAVs are concerned. I'll just show you a few shots. This is the sword sharp uh, flying wing design, UCAV, and here is a rotary wing um, attack helicopter unmanned. And uh, this is a cargo carrying ship borne 200 kg payload aircraft which has flown. The videos are available. So what is the operational impact of all these ongoing developments in Pakistan and China? I'll concentrate more on China. So what is the projection of China in 2035? There would be J-20s in substantial strength and they're already talking of a sixth generation fighter being developed based on the J-20. And if you recollect the R&D budget that they are pumping in, I think we, we should take that as a truth. Uh, the mainstays would still be the aircraft. Remember, we are talking roughly 15 years from now. Uh, would still be the J-10, J-11, J-16, and the J-16D. Will they get more Su-35s beyond the 24 that they have? Uh, may not. I don't think so, because they will continue to get more J-20s. The long-range strategic bomber should be flying by 2035 the prototypes, the Y-20 with the indigenous engine, 66 tons capability would be the base for AVACs and FRA. The advanced heavy lift helicopter should be entering service. We have to look out whether that AN-225 plant starts producing in China. What about the infrastructure in Tibet by 2035? Will they have climatized hangars? This is a shot of one of the developments of the airfields in the South China Sea. These here are all climate controlled hangars. So for them to make it in Tibet and get the infrastructure going in Tibet and develop it, we must plan for it. Continuing with the projections, the aerial weapons would get more potency. The air defense would be S-400 based and would there be Chinese copies? I suppose so. Space. Net centricity in good measure. The DG mentioned about the space project that they have. <coughs> Training will be revamped. If you read the Chinese media, uh, they are going berserk with projecting the type of exercises that they are doing and how they are trying to get the individuality, which is uh, so common in our Air Force, into their Air Force, which they are lacking right now. Realistic scenario. And would that be negating the present advantage that we have? The op impact, you see the bigger picture. We talk of A2 AD with respect to South China Sea, anti-access area denial. Isn't that for us too? With higher ranges of fighters and it's basically pushing back of boundaries. So higher ranges of their aircraft in future with a long range strategic bomber, increased FRA and AFAX capability, increase in ranges of their BVR missiles and the infrastructure development in, in Tibet. That acts as an A to AD policy as far as we are concerned too. And the link with the PLA rocket forces. Now, PLA rocket forces assets will be targets for us. But how to, uh, uh, to match what their war plans are is a subject for another discussion. But we need to remember this. Mobilization capability will go up many fold within, and within Tibet and from outside into Tibet with the Y-20, the Y-9, and the helicopters that I just talked about. India fact sheet, presently. I think we have better airlift. Yes, we are better both fixed wing and rotary wing, including in Tibet. We have a better airlift capability. Better airfield infrastructure and locations, uh, which the DG mentioned earlier. A more modern offensive fleet presently. AVAX and FRA with respect to China, almost similar. Better aircrew training status. But, and this is the uh, map. Uh, you can get this on any atlas. Our airfields, which are uh, self-supported, not too much distance apart. Whereas if you look in the Tibetan regions, the airfields are far spaced, not uh, you know, supporting each other. But that can change, as I brought out earlier. And that will change, actually. So the challenge is facing us. The fast depleting fighter squad inventory, which the chief mentioned in his talk. The fifth generation AMCA, 
will only be flying, beginning to fly by 2030. A stagnant AVAX and FRA number at present. Uh, we know how many times the, the uh, RFPs have been floated. The space program priority is still civilian. I think more emphasis on the military aspects are required. And I talked about the training which they are doing. Um, we need to remember that we may find better pilots against us. And the indigenous military industry, for us, if we act now and we push now, we're still two decades away. We must act now. I don't want to neglect the Indian Ocean region. Suffice to say that it's still some time till the time their CBG enters the IOR in a real menacing way. But this is the general picture. The Chinese being we know in Djibouti, Gwadar, Hambantota, and pushing us out of Mali, they are there in Myanmar, sold submarines to Bangladesh, and sometimes wonder why Bangladesh requires submarines. The US is here, as well as it, uh, three years back, we should not punch below our weight or over our weight. We must punch proportionately. Heading back to what Shivshankar Menon said some time back, for considerable time to come, India will be a major power with several poor people. We must always, therefore, be conscious of the difference between weight, influence, and power. Power is the ability to create and sustain outcomes. Weight we have. Our influence is growing, but our power remains to grow and should first be used for our domestic transformation. Now, this was said seven years back. Our power has increased, but the fact remains that for development of any country, the hard power is actually a foundation. The military power is required. How we develop that? What are the requirements? Where are we lacking? Have we slowed down? Will be talked about by the subsequent speakers. Thank you. Jayant.